It takes us about six years, or roughly the amount of time for somebody to get a PhD to tell you a little bit about how one chemical can perform in the environment. And that's simply incompatible with the way that decisions are made in industry. The problem with the way that we innovate is that we have an idea, we invest in performance and cost, and performance and cost. And engineering professors are the worst at this. We train our students to do that. And as we are doing that, some chemical, maybe the product itself or a byproduct from the manufacturer, starts to accumulate in the environment. And that accumulation is what leads to some observable public health or ecological impact putting things into the system faster than we take them out. This leads to something that I call the four R's of dooms. Reparations, remediation, public relations, and reinvestment. Now our strategy so far has been to tweak one bond and repeat the whole damn cycle again. <laughs> and we've spent the last 120 years proving that that doesn't work. What we need to do differently is actually quite simple. We need to invest a little bit more, just past the point of conception of an idea, in the environmental optimization along with performance and cost. If we do that right, we can bring the product to market for lower cost and have sustainable profits for all time. <laughs> and in part, degradation by design. The important pieces that we need to consider here are the time it takes to do this, the cost, and the functional performance. Nobody likes a paper straw. I want to talk to you today about how we plan to surmount these challenges and introduce a new approach to sustainable design. And I'll talk about it through the lens of one of the most Instagrammable of pollutants, plastics. Today at MIT, we're working feverishly to understand the rules of degradation so that we can use them to inform next generation material design. What precisely about a physical or chemical structure gives rise to degradation in an environmental system? What gives rise to performance? And how do we co-optimize those two things? In Professor Bradley Olson's group in chemical engineering, they're varying chemical structure and testing biodegradation in high throughput. Here, clearance zones shown around a bacterial colony indicate where bacteria have eaten or digested a polymer around them. These plates can be read autonomously rather than by armies of graduate students, allowing for a fast, low-cost assessment of biodegradability. In my group, we're taking a similar approach with other environmental stimuli, like sunlight and mechanical force. You're looking at an early prototype that includes only nine test wells each, but will someday be compatible with any 96-well plate geometry. This means that it can be paired with chemical synthesis by robots, pharmaceutical systems and pharmaceutical production, as well as autonomous screening techniques. These data will be generated quickly, at low cost, and en masse so that they can inform industrial decision making. Importantly, each one of these polymers is also assessed for functional performance metrics so that we can understand how well they serve their intended function in the application space. Now, to leverage this data, each chemical structure must be translated into a language that a computer can understand. Now, using that, we can systematically vary the chemical structure and ask the computer what in the polymer makes it degradable? What makes them perform from a functional performance perspective? And then we can start to relate that environmental and functional performance metric simultaneously. Now, not only does this improve our fundamental understanding and give us a tool to co-optimize materials for functional and environmental performance simultaneously, but it also lets us take a chemical or material that's just been imagined, never made or tested, and predict its environmental fate. This could save enormous sums of money and time. That's really the future of sustainable design. Today, we're making this information publicly available through CRYPT, a community resource for innovation in polymer technology. We're engaging a broader audience in the development of the database so that we can grow it from the half a million structures it contains today to the many million more that will be needed to help us machine learn what imparts degradability to a material. Polymer property data are there. 
the environmental fate data are not. We need help building that capability so we can start to truly understand degradation in a systematic way and use that knowledge so that we can impart degradability to all of our new products and chemical materials. It's time to really abandon the fantasy we have about perfect material recovery. Few products are ever made, produced, used and disposed of without some release to the environment. For plastics, it'll start to be on the order of 33% continued through 2050. If we can recognize that our species is going to continue to modify our environment through chemical mechanisms, we can use advances in computation, high throughput environmental degradation screening, and autonomous learning to predict impacts during the design phase. We can innovate materials that are inherently more compatible with the Earth system. That's planetary stewardship. <laughs>